Hi. <laughs> I'm Victoria Gracie. And I'm Eve Gracie. Welcome to Women Empowered Live, where we gather with our community and discuss effective tools and strategies to develop our sense of physical, psychological, and emotional safety. Because we believe that when we feel safe, we're more likely to take risks, um, embrace our freedom, and live a more empowered life. And we have special guest Hedon here today because we have an extra special guest here today. Which yes. we will introduce. We, we are so excited. Uh, we are going to introduce Doc Jen. You may know her as at Doc Jen Fit on Instagram. She is a doctor in physical therapy, the creator of the mobility method, the brilliant mind behind the Optimal Body website and podcast, and one of the hardest working women out there who offers incredible educational content to her followers on a daily basis. Daily. So, welcome, Jen. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank yes, you guys. Awesome. I so appreciate being here. I love you too. So this is fun. Sorry, Hedon, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we met Jen uh, at, at through Lisa Bilyeu, um at a Women of Impact event and, you know, connected. And I just thought we, you know, we thought everyone needs to, if they're not already, everyone needs to follow her. She has such incredible information. I've benefited so much from your information. And so whenever we feel like we have you know, gold in our hands. We're like, we got to let every, make sure everyone knows about this. Yeah. If there's one thing I've said, I, and I recognize with doc Jen fit or Jen's Instagram really early on is that she's one of the few people that I see just not only give away information for free, but that actually is instantly life-changing in that moment. Like one small adjustment in the way you start to live your life daily can really make a physical impact in longevity. And when I said that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is important information. How can we connect with her? Because everybody we know, whether you do jujitsu or not, has some sort of like ailment. They wake up with that crick in the neck. They may, they feel like a little bit like stiff in the body. So if you're looking, for, first of all, for free content, she gives it more than anyone I know. She's producing on a daily basis. When I, when I had lunch with her, I was like, wait, what are you doing? She's like, I'm constantly working and she works so hard. It's fantastic. So if you don't mind, Jen, I just want to get started first kind of exploring the difference or the relatability between flexibility and mobility and why should we care? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. You guys, you two are incredible. And when I did the little mini session at Lisa's, I was like, I gotta get back into this. This is so much fun. It is incredibly empowering and it just feels good to have these tools readily available. And you guys do such an incredible job with teaching. So thank you for having me. I just, I feel this energy. So fun to say that. Um, <laughs> now, difference between mobility and flexibility, that's like one of the most common things I think everyone wants to know. Flexibility, we can really just think about it's the passive ability within your body to get into a stretch. So it is you're laying on a table and someone is just taking your leg and passively stretching it. You're not doing any work. You're not doing anything within your body. Someone else is doing it to you or strap or you're laying into it and your body is just relaxed. So that's flexibility, but it's, it's not a true sign of what you have in your body. And so you could be working through flexibility. You could put your legs up on mats and get as much splits as you can, but is that actually going to translate into functional movement? And is that actually going to translate into you even being able to lift your leg into that full range, right? And so I think when it comes to actually, you know, finding what mobility is, mobility is the active component of being able to achieve whatever range of motion. So think of it like active range of motion. So if I can if someone can lift my arm and get it behind my ear, that's great. But can I do that on my own? Can I functionally, without anyone helping me, can my shoulder blade do what it needs to do? Can my shoulder joint do what it needs to do? Are my muscles reacting and all responding together to produce this full range of motion rather than everything being relaxed? And that's where mobility becomes so incredibly important that I feel like we all need to be thinking about in everyday life, whether you're an athlete, whether you're just stay at home, whatever it is, we all need to be thinking about it because it is literally the functional ability within our body to move well, to achieve different ranges of motion and to actually feel good within our body throughout these different ranges and expose our body to a better resilience in range of motion. Yeah. So I, I want to ask a little bit about injury prevention in the context of mobility, because I think like most people, they're not really thinking about how to be proactively uh, mobile, right. Or have mobility. 
unless it affects them in a negative way. So like most people, they only deal with it when it's a problem. Um, and I'm like slowly raising my hand. A same with bit. relationships, same with cars, same yeah, with everything. Like, you're like, when it's fixed, yeah. when it's broken, I'll fix it. Um, but, now, but now let's talk about it. So when we talk about injury, either prevention or even healing from injuries, um, m- many of our viewers are trained jujitsu, obviously, or our other form of athlete. And a lot of the most common injuries that we see are neck injuries, back injuries, knee and shoulder. Or all the above. Or all (laughs) the the boxes. Uh, And I think that naturally what happens is people, you know, encounter injuries, they, you know, try to fix it. They work on it for a little bit. And then usually that same injury comes back and comes back and comes back. And so I guess what is the you know, what is your approach when it comes to injury prevention? Uh, maybe we'll start with prevention and then we can kind of work on the healing aspect of once injuries happen. Yeah. Well, you know, when it comes to prevention, I think the one thing that we all should be doing is making sure that we're exposing ourselves to enough different variables within movement. And that's, that's why I go back to what are you even building upon? Where's your foundational layer? And If we look at, you know, a baby and watch their developmental patterns, first thing that we'll notice is that they naturally are easily breathing in and out throughout their bellies. No one's telling them to belly breathe. No one's telling them what to do. It's this natural experience that happens within a baby. And you know that they're in stress if they start using their chest. And yet it's something that we don't even address anymore as we get older. Wow. So that's base number one. And then we go on top of that a baby is naturally developmentally going to put their toes in their mouth before at like five months old and they start exploring these different things and they have this range of motion within their body before they even start to pattern in crawling, before they even start to stand or explore squatting to, to standing. So before we're, we're building in strength, we're naturally building in this range of motion. We're getting the joints and the hips open. We're getting the the muscles to lengthen and move in different positions. And so if we think about that as adults, why do we lose that? Well, I think jiu-jitsu does an amazing job. Like you guys are sitting on the ground right now. Do you know how many people would be so uncomfortable just being able to do that? Most people can't, unfortunately. And so you're already doing an amazing job with just coaching yourself into better mobility there because on average, people are going to be sitting on in desks and chairs more. They're going to be sitting in cars and then come home and sit at the dinner table, sit on couches. And we're never putting our body into this full range of motion. Then we're going to go work out and expect it to be just fine. But we've limited the time and experience of even being able to get into that range. Let me pause you for a second. Are you suggesting that I shouldn't sit in, like I've always thought chair is more comfortable. Let me find a chair or I even offer when someone comes to my home, right? Please, here's a, here's a chair. Yeah. Am I doing them a better, better service to say, here's a floor? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you saying? Technically, yeah. I think wow. it's great. No one wants to, right? And like we're, we've gotten better at this, especially with being at home and, and desks and going from sit to stand desk. And that's better because we're getting people to at least go to standing a little bit more, but we're still missing a whole ground aspect. Like I think an incredible desk and chair would be able to sit all the way down on the floor comfortably and then stand all the way up. Like you can have all the in-betweens. You could be kneeling, you could be laying down, you could be whatever it is. That would be the most functional thing for our bodies. Okay. So if anyone comes to my house, please don't be offended if I invite you to sit on a little rug. (laughs) Welcome. Sit on the floor. (laughs) I got you a patch of carpet. (laughs) Practice your Save money on furniture. Why not? (laughs) Yeah. Right. We don't have a couch. We in don't. our house right now. <laughs> and she's been wanting to buy one and now we're not going to. Oh, no. oh my gosh. You did that to yourself. You just did that. Well, actually, Jen did that. Thanks a lot, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> you asked the question. Save you some money on that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, right, continue. Yeah. Please yes. continue. So the range of motion from the baby, they, so they start with breath, then they yeah. move to their mobility of like toes in their mouth. Mm-hmm. And now we're getting sitting on the floor, no longer, everyone's throwing their couches out. Okay, now what? This kind of <laughs> reminds me of the, the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. Exactly. And That's kids, exactly it. kids play, kids use it all. And there is something that happens. And I imagine that that happens when you get into the work force or when you get into school well actually i'm I'm asking i'm I'm curious when does it happen like when do we when is like typically the age that we start to lose our mobility because i honestly i've seen it even with haven from yeah a baby being able to touch your you know eat your toes and 
now at five, he's can barely touch his toes when he when he runs over. So like how at what point does that happen? It was the chairs how in her house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Blame it on chairs. Yeah, I think it's such a hard question to quantify because it depends on every single kid and what they're doing, if they're sure. out and being active. Um, I think the less that we you know, the less time that we allow kids to just go outside and play instead of like stay inside and play video games. I know that's hard and I know it's not always as accessible for people, but the more that we give the, the kid the opportunity to play, to get into sports, to move, to, to do different things, it's just going to be a better outcome for their body. And I, I mean, I don't think you need me to really, it just makes sense. We don't need studies, do we really? Like <laughs> the more activity, it just makes sense, right? And that's where it's like, okay, if we actually want to talk about prevention, then we have to start moving into the things that we're not doing. And that's all prevention is. It's saying, what am I doing mo more often? How can I do that more optimally? And then what are the things that I've been neglecting within my body? And that, that encompasses a whole realm and that I think people forget all the time. Like, how am I managing my stress? Am I getting sleep? Am I getting adequate water consumption? What kind of foods am I putting in my body? And then <laughs> what am I doing in order to slow down my stress levels? Am I breathing? Am I addressing my rib cage? Am I going into my, my mobility and kind of touching on that every now and then? And it doesn't, it, it can feel really overwhelming, but at the same time, if we just break it down and be like, okay, what have I been neglecting lately? How can I start adding that in? Like, for the strength athlete who's only doing weight training, what have you been neglecting? Have you been warming up? Have you been doing mobility? Have you been doing core, like specifically and doing more Pilates type stuff? Or if you are doing Jiu Jitsu, what, how have you been changing up your body in other aspects? Are you standing? Are you lifting weight? Are you, uh, you know, the, it's just, how can we add in that piece of variability and pay attention to what we're neglecting the most? And that's why I bring up mobility and it's the easiest thing. And honestly, the thing that people caught on to the most, and maybe because I'm a mobile person already. And so they thought, oh, that's something I don't have. <laughs> but it was just this natural thing that kind of came out of my gram. Like I would post mobility to corrective exercises, to strength, to everything. But the only thing people wanted to learn was mobility. And I think it was because it was, especially at like the rise of social media, it was the one thing that was being overlooked and neglected. Most of it, and most of the time, we're looking for the fancy stuff. We're looking for the yeah. sexy stuff. What's going to make me look good? What's going to make me, you know, aesthetically pleasing rather than how am I going to prevent injury? Well, but Jen, you made mobility sexy. So let me just- That's so, right. This is the mobility queen right yes. here that we've got. So one thing that I'm kind of hearing is that that which you neglect is what you're kind of putting at risk. Mm -hmm. correct of getting injured and you said people don't want to address those things they want that which is sexy or yeah. cool they want what's very specific to what they enjoy doing exactly so, so what you're talking about the mobility you're talking about which is how i also understand mobility from people that i've learned other things from is that it, it's very much long term mm -hmm. it's it's way beyond mm -hmm. you know these next two years or four years or this while you're on this team in your in college or in high school it's for when you're 72 years old you're kind of building a way of living mm -hmm. so now what's what do you guys have planned next? well now i actually want, <laughs> i want to know that, yeah. that's a great question because here's here's let me explain my situation is i would go doing my normal yoga a little bit take a break and then i'd go back to yoga or to jujitsu and then i would get injured like something, I would creak my neck and that is my, my pain spot, right? I'm a neck injury. Mm -hmm. And my other one is my knee. I've had two knee surgeries in my knee. So when I go to yoga, all of a sudden my knee tweaks. Oh, and then I, I blame yoga mm -hmm. or I blame jujitsu. I didn't, oh, I did the triangle today. That's one of the ones that always, it's that angle for me of my knee, which is not the best for the ACL meniscal situation. I went, <laughs> And people get injured in jujitsu and then they blame jujitsu and then they never want to come back. Never blame jujitsu for anything. <laughs> well, but 
but Jen, tell them why it's, it's possible. Cause I've, I've heard different things from different people. Like, no, no, keep coming to yoga, work through it or find a way. Tell them why they sh we shouldn't be blaming the sports for the injuries that we're getting at the sports, right? Yeah. yeah or, or if we want, if we love a sport, yeah. right? Like if we love jujitsu and we're like, oh man, I have to give up jujitsu because my neck, like, what is the, what is your approach to that? And I know you yourself have worked through incredible injuries um, and, and pain. So what, what do we tell people who they, you know, they love a sport, they love something, yeah. they've had to give it up because of an injury. Tell like, what is the approach? To. Yeah. Save us. Save no. us all from our favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> my one recommendation is can you increase your awareness of what you're doing within that movement pattern and i think that's the one thing that we never we we never get the opportunity to really look into and you know what that's going to require asking a little bit more questions that's going to require exploring a little bit deeper and most of the time we say i don't have time for that i don't have time to like sit after class and go over it with my yoga instructor. I don't have time to sit down with my jujitsu and see what I could be going, what else could be happening with my body. Or I don't feel like my, my team of people would want to work together. I don't feel like my doctor and my physical therapist and my instructor would all want to collaborate, which is not true. Like, especially as physical therapists, believe me, we want to collaborate with, who, with what you're doing in life. We want to know who are you learning from in terms of fitness or instructors for a particular sport or a trainer. We want to talk to them because then we can collaborate to keep you moving, to keep you functioning well. Why is your knee tweaking? Is it your knee or is it your hip? Can we be looking at something else where your physical therapist could be working through this so that you can still do jiu-jitsu and you can go into these extreme positions and all of a sudden not feel that tweak, not feel that pain. And I think that's where it's like, we just have to be okay with asking more questions. And I think that's really hard for people, especially what kind of questions, what am I supposed to be asking for? What am I doing? If something is hurting, I'm out. There's usually the thing, like I shouldn't be doing it. I'm afraid I'm going to get more injured. That's mm -hmm. usually the, the fear, right? If I keep doing it, if I keep going, it's going to cause more injury. And what I usually like to say is like, our body is so dang resilient. It really is resilient. It knows how to, I mean, it, it's smart, knows how to compensate for sure. <laughs> um, but it also knows how to build strength in other ways. So if you were to just go after class with your instructor and say, can you look at my body positioning? Could there be something else that's maybe getting tight and, and restricted? My knee is putting on more pressure than normal. Like, why might this be happening in my body? Could you go to a local physical therapist and at least just do one session? Now, it, it scares people because you probably have to pay out of pocket, right? You probably, if, you're, if your doctor isn't going to diagnose and prescribe a direct thing for physical therapy, you're going to have to pay out of pocket for your insurance. But yeah. is it worth going one time to just get an assessment and see what's happening within your body and ask your therapist, could you... Could you write a note? Could you talk to my trainer? Could you do something where you understand how I can work together so that I can start to overcome this ultimately? And really it's like when patients come to see me, because I don't see as many anymore, I don't want to see you very often. I want to give you the tools and then send you on your way. Mm. And I want to know who I need to communicate with, what we need to do in order so that max, maybe I see you four times and that's spread out over a couple months. But a good therapist wants to, to see what's happening and teach you the tools to actually be able to use that on your own and go back to the thing that you absolutely love. Mm. I, so feel like, I, feel like you're, I feel like when you have pain, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's your body telling you that which you have neglected and that which you need to work on is what you're saying. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it's almost like mm -hmm. when it happens the only thing you need to know is that the information is out there right to heal your body and your body wants to get back into alignment your body doesn't want that pain yeah. so if you know those two things there's almost no reason for you to and that's why it's tough when someone says i don't have time because your body wants to get there and the information is there. And when you do it now, it's gonna serve you two years, 10 years, 30 years from now.
I think the hard part about that for many people is understanding <clears throat> what it is they've neglected, right? And I love how you address that, like mm. essentially, or, or, or and he don't you kind of explain that from how you understood it, which is mobility is addressing what you've ne neglected. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people don't even know what they've neglected and why, like if you, like for me, it's my, my, I always, I, my neck is my, my problem area. And so you're thinking, oh gosh, I got to focus on my neck, right? Not realizing that this is all connected. Um, and so how do we even identify what we're neglecting when we just, and obviously this is seeking the information, asking the questions, but um, how do you approach that? And I know maybe we can even give an example. So like, let's say I'm like, let's use me for example. So I can, I can get your, well, that's, that's what I'm asking. Well, is there a way to self-identify or is this something that you go, you know what, every injury is so specific that you really do want somebody to kind of take a comprehensive look at you and, and to identify, you know, where, where you're neglecting, or is it something where you go, chances are, if you have knee problems, you're neglecting this, or chances are, if you have neck problems, you're neglecting, you know, X, Y, or Z. Yeah. So as always, this typical physical therapy answer, it depends. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, but I think it, it does start first. Initially, you have to at least get into a program or get into a physical therapist where you can at least start to have that person who's going to educate you. Mm -hmm. Like my, like the mobility method, for example, it starts with a 23 movement self-assessment. I'm not telling oh. you what to start in. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying you have to figure it out. So can you give an example of one of those movements, like how you would assess uh, uh, based on one of those movements? Yeah. I mean, simple movement would be standing and rotating. And even, so I ask people to stand, rotate, and take a video. Do you see one shoulder rotating more than when you rotate the other way? You see how all of a sudden you, you just self-assess yourself, which way rotates more than the other. Sure. And the one we can do while sitting, so I don't have to stand out of the spring cramp. <laughs> the neck, the neck, right? So if I turn left. <laughs> sitting and rotating, do you feel mm -hmm. restriction or can one side rotate more than the other? Mm -hmm. I know, Jen, for me, I could look maybe three quarters this way, but like over my shoulder on the right. So correctively mm -hmm. for my neck, I don't even, this is, but this has been this way my whole life. I'm here and I stay here, but I can go all the way behind me on this side. The answers are out I, there. No, I'm asking her right now. She's I know, right here. I know. She is out there. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Tell me, Jen, what do I do with this? I think of what is it, Zoolander? He's like, I can't turn left. Yeah. <laughs> turn left. <laughs> so that depends. Like that's where I would say, is that is that your your nervous system that automatically restricts you because it it's something that you've created over time that I can't do this. So I know, like I'm always or. Or I know that when I turn the other way, I'm used to getting more range. So I'm actually going to help with my shoulders and with my body. Like, are you even getting that range? Or is that something that you've just built into your mind that that is your natural pattern? So that's when I say lay on the ground and then see like passively how it feels to lay your head one side mm -hmm. or the other. And is it different? Because if you can passively get your head to actually rotate and it's just fine, then it might be something that we're working with a little bit more neurologically in terms of connecting your what you're used to doing and creating a different pattern, creating a different message from your from your nervous system out into the muscles. One thing that you said, I, I think it was on a podcast, which was like mind blowing to me, which I didn't know, was that uh, we can actually like if our brain was turned off and our nervous system was turned off, our bodies could move however you wanted them to, right? So I could, if I, if I didn't feel any pain, I could, I could actually move, pull my leg up to my ear. Yeah. Is that right? It's, and it's scary in surgery when you see doctors like doing hip replacements, legs are going like, oh my God. Because, you can. <laughs> because you can, you can, wait, so I'm sorry. That was a little bit mind blowing for a second. Let's reverse yeah. that because basically what you're saying, which is probably like the theme of all people's life story is that we are our own limiting human belief systems in here. Our brains and our nervous systems are limiting us, us from our fullest potential. Or protecting us. I don't protecting. want to say like mm. limiting because then Thank people you. feel like, oh, this is all my fault. This is like my... You spoke to my shame bug so quick right there. Very good. <laughs> Keep going. Our body is, is always serving us. So it's yeah. just here to protect us and let us and, and alert us when it needs to. And that's all it's trying to do. Yeah. So in a way, just like he said where, you know, 
your pain is a good thing because it's your alarm system. Mm. It's just trying to say, hey, something's going on that doesn't feel very good. And I'm just wanting to alert you. I want you to know before it turns into something worse. So what a gift that we have. It's like, we pay attention to all these other signals. I yawn, I'm super tired, I need to get more sleep. Sure. My stomach is grumbling, I know I need to eat food. You know, we, we pay attention to these other signals within the body, but the one that we neglect the most or we're most afraid of is pain. And we say, mm -hmm. what is the quickest fix? I need a Band-Aid, someone crack me, someone do something to me because I don't know what to do. And we, we have been built into this model where we're dependent on others rather than being dependent on our own bodies. And I think it's the mo it's, it's the saddest thing. My goal isn't to fix people. My goal is to bring people tools and bring people awareness. So even if they were in my programs for a couple months and then they walked away, they would know what to do. They have understanding within their body. They have, and even if they don't know what to do, they know what kind of questions to ask. If you go see a physical therapist, you know, you already have an understanding of your body. So you can mm. ask better questions so that you can get better answers. And, and I think that's like, we've been so conditioned into needing band-aids for pain and only focusing on the symptom rather than actually getting into the cause and addressing the body as a whole and knowing that there's no one fix. <laughs> there is no one thing. Like even if we look at research studies, we know that research studies are in order to get it actually published, there has to be some kind of elements of control. There has to be controlled elements within the study, which just isn't human nature. We're not built in a test tube. We all, we're messy. This is something that my, one of my professors, we just interviewed him, he's a biomechanist. And so this is what he does. For 20 years, he's been studying human movement. But the reality is, as much as he can publish studies, that's just not always going to be the case. Like we are so unique. So whether you want to pull up a study and shove it in someone's face, you have to look at the person as a whole and, and being willing to go see a physical therapist who's also going to ask you about your life, who's going to ask you about your stressors and how you're managing them and what your work schedule is like and how much you're moving and not just like, oh, here's your shoulder pain. Here's what you should do for your shoulder pain. Because mm. then we're just, we're missing the whole human. So would you say that if you go see a physical therapist and they do say, oh, here's your shoulder pain, do a shoulder exercise. Would you say to maybe run the other direction or find another, <laughs> another person? Like, cause I think that just like anything, you know, there's, there's different quality of instruction or support or uh, professionals. And so how do people find a good physical therapist? Like, what do we, what do we consider? What do, look for? What, what do we look for? What kind of questions do we ask them? Or what are like the red flags when you're mm. picking a physical therapist? You know, it's unfortunate that your insurance company is probably going to pay for your standard mill type of physical therapy where you're, you're seeing mostly the, physical therapy assistants or the aides, and you're not even in touch with the physical therapist as much. Like you're on the table, they're working on you, and then you're off with an aid, which honestly, that was how I worked in that environment as an aide, and it was so much fun because I got to be with the patient all the time. But as a physical therapist, you're hardly seeing them. Yeah. And, and so it doesn't really cultivate, like how do they know what's really happening? How do they know what really is, is needed? So I think like, as always, if we want to get better answers, we have to ask one, we have to even ask questions. We can't just go and say, okay, well, this is what they said. And we have to ask better questions. So if you don't understand why that exercise would help you ask, if mm -hmm. you don't understand why your shoulder might be in pain, if you're not seeing a connection through your body or what you're doing in your everyday, ask, there has to be educational support from your therapist, especially your therapist. Maybe your MD doesn't have as much time. And quite honestly, they are not as specialized in musculoskeletal care as a physical therapist. This is why we're doctors of physical therapy. Usually, like I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a, a prescription from an MD and it's like back pain, shoulder pain. And I'm like, wow. thank you for giving me the symptom. That's, a, <laughs> that's not a diagnosis, right? And that's okay. That's not I, I don't blame them. That's not, that's not their expertise. It's mine and it should be mine. And if I'm not seeing something that's getting better, or if I'm seeing something that 
gets worse or there's other red flags that I know of for differential diagnosis, I know that I need to send them back to an MD for extra testing. And that's where it's also like, if we could stay in our lanes more, like chiros and PTs are great at understanding the musculoskeletal system and how this all comes together. MDs are great at seeing internally and seeing what else could be happening from an organ standpoint, from a radiate, from you know radiating pains in terms of what's happening deeper into the body. Um, and if and for a trainer, like you can't just massage out an area and expect that it's going to get better for the person. Like mm -hmm. if we have our team of people, our good physical therapists, our good trainers, our good MDs, and they all kind of that that's the ultimate goal, yeah, right? Definitely. So, I mean, long-winded answer. I think it's just ask better questions. If you don't understand it, if you don't understand why you might still be in pain, if you don't understand that exercise or how, when, when would you even do it? If it's not applicable into your life, you're not going to do it. If you don't think it's going to help you, you're not going to do it. If you don't understand it, you're not going to do it. And that's where I say it's not the physical therapist, you know, fault that the client didn't do any of the exercises. It's the physical therapist's fault that they didn't make you understand why it's important. Now, mm. you're talking about a team of people. Everyone's got this team. Like professional athletes have teams of people around them. You know what I mean? We might have a team. I might have the luxury to have that, you know, with what, what I do for a living. But most people don't have a team of people and and that's okay. And I'm sure that even though they don't have a team, they can still pay the money, which is hard to pay, right? You said oh, this whole out-of-pocket thing. It's tough to see $150 going out or $200, you know, once a week for two months. And it seems impossible. And I almost feel like even though you don't want to do it, if, if it's your body, it's worth it to some degree. You have to really decide what matters at that time and maybe eliminating some other things and really going into a position where you might feel uncomfortable paying for that paying for that treatment but if you come in with the questions like you said asking the good questions and really getting the most of those sessions there's almost no reason why not if you can swing it do it even though it might be a little tight and yeah. then i think about asking questions and people don't want to ask questions sometimes do you feel this because they don't want to challenge the physical therapist they, like what does this do for my body? How does this help me? As if it's insinuating that you don't really know what you're telling me to do. And we see this in jujitsu also, where why would I want to grab like this and not like that? You're challenging my authority and my information. So I guess that's not the case, right? A good physical therapist wants to inform you on what it is that you're learning because they want you to get better. The same way we want to answer those questions of why would I grab like this instead of like this, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I have to tell you, Jen, I, I remember actually being with a physical therapist after I've had two knee surgeries again. And at, at some point I was just so mad and bothered. So I just want to give some empathy to the, when you're in pain, you're like, I don't know. I don't really care. Fix this, make it go away. Like there is some part of like the throwing of the hands of like, I did, you know, I was an athlete. I played basketball. I, I spent hours and hours a week giving my training or trusting my coach in, in leading my training sessions to a place of optimal movement and function and, and winning. I just need the W, you know? So I can understand where people feel like almost exasperated of like, man, I don't even care how I got here, just fix it. But I can also see how that kind of made me almost like the victim, right? Like I was almost like turning myself into the victim, like, well, it happened to me. So can you just do your thing where you do this? But what I feel, and you can correct me where I'm wrong here, my interpretation, is if we do enough mobility, if we if we invest in ourselves preventatively, and, and Stephanie wrote about it, like you either pay the doctor or the pay the farmer. Like if you do enough preventative, then we won't have to pay as much corrective. Is that is that the general feel here? And can we educate ourselves in life? And like one of those things is your methods. Like what you offer is the self assessment to then go, okay, I keep doing things to my right. That's why I can't look left. <laughs> I keep turning right. Is that, is, is that what we're, we're essentially saying is like to really stay investing in the preventative so that, so that the corrective is needed less? Is that? That would be the goal, right? That's always the goal. And I think you can find great providers that, that are within your insurance company. You just, you might have to shop around and that's okay. Like it is okay to say, listen, I don't vibe with the information that you're giving me. I don't vibe with, you know. Oof, that's hard to say. <laughs> that's hard to say to somebody. 
but you don't say that to them. You right, just don't do that. If yeah. you don't feel like they have your best interest, if you don't feel like they cared about your, your injury, if you don't feel like you understand your body after you left that session, why mm -hmm. would you continue to go? Don't go. Right. Don't waste your time. Like, well, even if your insurance is paying for it, don't just don't waste your time. And there's almost so, something you said about like what he don't, what he don't mentioned, which is if you do have to pay out of pocket, if you go with the approach of I'm learning to fish, I'm not just going for fish, right? I'm, I'm paying this money as like an education into understanding my body better so that you don't have to just keep going every week. You just go, tell me everything I need to do. And then you go by, hopefully, like you, like you said, you hope that you only see a patient four times over the course of months because they're implementing the strategies and the techniques that you're teaching them while you're together. Exactly. Yep. hundred percent. And obviously that's going to change. Like if you get a direct injury, if you have an acute injury, you just came out of surgery, whatever it may be. Yeah. You're going to need to see someone a little bit more <laughs> to have them walk you yes. along that tissue healing journey. But if you, if this is something that's a recurrent injury, a reoccurrent pain, something that's a little bit more chronic, you're still managing, you're still moving, but you're just not feeling right in your body, go get at least one assessment. Just give your, op your body the opportunity to just see the possibilities of what you're not aware of. And awareness is key. How do we know what to change? How do we know what to fix until we have that awareness? And you don't have to know it all yourself, but, but you know, trusting someone to help you along that journey. That's, that's what we are as physical therapists. We're not fixing anyone. I'm facilitating the pathway. And that's what would make me a good physical therapist is if I can facilitate you. Because if I'm fixing you, it's a great business model, <laughs> but it's not, it's not actually reality. And that's not how I believe that we should be helping people. And, and, and when something is injured and it's out of whack, a shoulder, a neck, how, how long should you wait, right? Do you wait two days, 10 days? Because sometimes people can say, yeah, it's been hurting for the last 17 days. It feels like a long time to be sitting on an injury before going and seeing somebody. So do you suggest like one, two days of discomfort, then you see somebody? You know, I, I would say wait at least five days because your body, especially like there's little tweaks that happens. There's little things like you slept a different way. Mm -hmm. You had extra stress within your week. You did something that exasperated some level of tension within your body. And again, that could be external. So, and your body is so good at healing itself and it can go away. But here's the thing that I would say, like, I wish that you know, like medical checkups, we just went once a year to a physical therapist and been like, okay, here's my body right now. I do a little assessment. Do you see anything that I could potentially, am I lacking in weakness? Am I lacking in mobility? Am I restricted somewhere? Am I not patterning well in my squat? Like what is something that could possibly turn into an injury down the road? And I just want one, one day, one quick assessment, give me some tools that I can work on. I mean, if we did that, that would, that would solve so many, so many, if, if insurance companies would just pay for one hour and a half session once a year, mm, I think, and point. required it, required it with a physical therapist, I think that could solve so much if we gave our bodies the opportunity to check in. Like that. And that's just for that assessment. That's an assessment that we often can't do ourselves or it's challenging to do ourselves. Yeah, insurance companies or even businesses. We could maybe do that at Gracie University for all of our instructors once a year. Done. Get Boom. seen by somebody yeah. who lives nearby, you know, not all the way in Arkansas. But I might know who somebody nearby. who lives nearby <laughs> and could take on all the instructors. <laughs> She's great. We also got, we also got Jason here too. Oh yeah, Jason works with you. He lives near you too. Yeah. So here, you know, here's what I'm also thinking, Jen, because we've become what I like to call Netflix Nation. Okay, and everybody is couch surfing, Netflixing, because we're in quarantine, um, or or have completely changed their work paradigm where they're no longer working at work; they're working from home. So has there been an increase or a decrease or a complete shift in any kind of the injuries you are now seeing? from the shift in lifestyles of the world. And when I say the world, I, I mean, you know, all of us in lockdown. You know, and I think the thing that's compounding that the most, because I think it's the regular typical stressors that we're seeing, increased back pain, increased neck pain. And the reason, obviously, yes, we're sitting, we can blame posture, we can blame what suddenly being in front of technology more and being in a forward posture. Yes, but I think beyond that even, 
we can blame stress. Like no one knows what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know if our businesses are getting shut down. If we have a job, if we can see our neighbor and have community, like a lot of things are being taken away from people. And especially with family, now you can't, can't take your kids to school. Like there's just so much that is shifted and there's an increased stress level. Mm, and so you're saying it's all connected. <laughs> crazy, right? <laughs> Such a, such a concept. Oh my God. So the stress does affect our physical. 100%. I mean, so think about, this is what I like to kind of take people into and in thinking about inflammation and tightness within the body. Because if we want to increase mobility, you can foam roll all day, you can stretch all day, and you might still be like, I can't touch my toes. Because there's just people like that. Like I do the things and nothing's changing. But if they're like, I do the things and nothing's changing, blah, 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 like imagine the stress. <laughs> That what? is my body. What? What? <laughs> Me. And that's most majority of people. And I would say moms and females, like no knocking the males, but in my experience with what I work with, women who, especially in this day and age, need to have a job, need to be taking care of the kids, taking care of the husband, cooking, da da da. Like there's no time for me. There's no time to assess what's happening here. And I'm just always having to run at this level. And if we think of like a regular breath cycle, the inhalation phase, the exhalation phase, the inhalation phase, think of someone scaring you and you go, <gasps> and we take an inhale and we hold. Mm -hmm. And our body also goes into protective mode and it, and it gets up really tight, right? Now think of the flip side, the exhalation state, that is like you're at the spa and you're like, ah, mm -hmm. it's a long exhale. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm living all day of like mouth breathing, of chest mm -hmm. breathing, of stress, of tension and everything, and I'm sucking in air, sucking in air, taking long, deep breaths in, and I'm only focusing on an inhale, I'm chronically driving that inflammation within my body. Wow. I'm going to be, I'm going to be feeling things a lot more. I'm going to be putting more tension on those nerves even because nerves can get inflamed. And I'm just always going to, and I'm always looking for the thing, the thing, what is the thing that's going to fix me? Cause I'm needing something more. And it just drives this inflammatory, stressful expectation, you know, overload on our bodies even more where it's like, okay, my body's talking to me. Cool. How can I chill first <laughs> and then address what's happening? How can I take longer exhales? How can I get my body tolerant to even building in more co2 by only using my nose like people won't even realize you'll be doing the dishes or watching tv netflix and you'll be like this <laughs> it's a normal thing a lot of people hang out with their mouths open and have no idea and not that you feel like you're sucking in air in and out but air is going to go in and out yeah so how can you close your mouth more nasal breathe Nasal breathing also is going to help release nitric oxide within the body, which is going to vasodilate our blood vessels. So again, that vasodilation is just going to help blood flow. It's going to help fluids. It's going to help oxygen get into different places within our body so that we have the opportunity to heal. We have the opportunity to release stress and inflammation within our body. Mm -hmm. But most people aren't taking the time. And again, that's not an hour meditation. Like go to bed, close your mouth and where are you breathing from? And mm -hmm. can you take a, a longer exhale? Can you sit in traffic and be thinking of longer exhales? Like there's different moments in time where we can implement these tools and it doesn't have to be so complicated, but we have to give our bodies the opportunity to chill when we, especially when we start to feel pain mm -hmm. rather than just like, what's the next thing and how can I fix it? And what do I need to do? And I, and especially in my practice as a physical therapist, that's the number one thing I see the most. It's like, I've been going to this person doing this and no one's helping me. Da, da, da. It's like, okay. Have you taken a breath today? <laughs> it's hard I, to I take a breath because we, we take on so many things, yeah. especially here in Los Angeles. You mm. can't breathe in this city. There's <laughs> other parts of the world. I'm sure it's probably easier to breathe and be a little less stressful and, and breathe through your nose more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have so many times where I recognize that. And actually a lot of it is, that is your content that I, when I watch and, and when, and whenever you do talk about breath or when everyone's talking about breathing, I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't taken a deep breath today yet. Like you'll just go through the whole day. And like you said, it's like, okay, what's next? And we're talking and we're hold. It's like, everything does feel like it's being held up here and there's no like 
oh, just like deep breaths. We can go through an entire day and not take a deep breath. And it makes total sense that that has an incredible effect on our body, on our stress level, on our inflammation. So what it sounds like you're saying is that not only, yes, we're sitting more, we're in front of a screen, we're you know doing that, but probably more, more damaging than that is, or equally as damaging, we'll say, is potentially added levels of stress. And no matter what we try to do in terms of increasing our mobility, if the stress levels are still high, they're going to be working against each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have a command for everybody watching this right now. <laughs> you're, first, you're going to follow yeah. Doc Jen Fit. And the minute yeah. you follow her, every time her, her image comes up, you're going to go, <sighs> but not like that. But okay. So show, <laughs> tell us, yeah. show us, tell us, let's do it. <laughs> so notice what happens, especially. So that's the thing Everybody that talks. usually, yes, we use the neck. Why is my neck hurt all the time? Well, mm. what am I doing? So this is where we want to see where am I directing the breath? As I take a breath, the main focus when, when someone says take a deep breath is mm. it's the rising, it's the inhale. I'm only thinking about an inhale. I'm thinking of relaxing and by reaching and lifting my chest, but actually my main respiratory muscle is my diaphragm and that rests underneath my rib cage. So what do I want to expand? I want my rib cage to expand. So even brought it. So sometimes I will just, and I show this in an Instagram post. So I just take a towel to be small and I wrap it right around my rib cage. Cause if I take a deep breath and I'm just like, Oh, we got one I'm too. I'm you can see I'm my, my neck start to but if I now squeeze, give my body just a little bit of a squeeze right around that low rib cage, not my waist, but my low rib cage area. And I say, I only want to breathe into this. I want to relax my shoulders. I don't want anything happening in my neck. And I want to do a little inhale opening from that and a long exhale. Do we exhale from our mouth, inhale from our nose? Is that what you're doing? The one. I'm doing it just because it kind of helps reteach the pattern. If you inhale through your nose, long exhale through the mouth, like you're blowing up a balloon or like you're blowing out a lot of candles. It's a good cue to kind of retrain that diaphragm. But can you get this to expand? And a lot of people can't get this lateral rib cage to move at all. This is like, oh, I've heard of belly breathing. That's but what I was going to say. I've heard of my rib cage. And the whole point is like, if, and I've had clients come in too when they are just like, oh, I've been working on belly breathing and their bellies are pushing in and out. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're not actually doing the thing that we are supposed to be doing. <laughs> so that's when it's like, okay, what is actually happening at the rib cage? And for a lot of people, like we should be able to get our fingers underneath this rib cage and it shouldn't be too painful and mm -hmm. it should be easy and relaxed. So if we're thinking of like starting to increase mobility, we have to be thinking about the breath. We have to be thinking about what the diaphragm is doing and how the fluids are moving. If you are always running at hundred percent, if your stress levels are super high, mobility, getting back to the basics, getting back to prevention is going to be really hard within the body. So I want to know, like, this is great. So taking <laughs> breaths in terms of like a routine, like you probably take these breaths every day, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Do you take time to breathe like this every day? And what else, right? As we begin our day, what else can we do? Do you do a cold shower in the mornings? Like do you, what else can be done? So to increase our mobility, right? To yeah. Increase our mobility, but also for our health, because maybe the breath is less for mobility. It is more for the stress, which allows the body to then. So I guess it is mobility, right? In the long run. It's the foundation. Like if we actually want to start building upon anything, I mean, you even think about stress, active or strength and activation. Like if we want to activate the proper muscles, we want to make sure that not everything is super tense and tight. Like most people, they're, the most one common complaint I can re repeat over and over again, my psoas, my psoas is tight. I need to stretch my hip flexor. I need someone to dig in. I have, there's release tools specific for the psoas now, everything. If this is a constant tightness, I'm going to say that it's not just your psoas, it's probably your system. And we need to stop digging in and trying to get, because 
if you actually look at an, an anatomy and how the muscles are built on top of each other and everything that's happening, the psoas is so deep, so deep. It, it goes up into the back. So yes, we can, we can try to put different pressures that actually help to melt into that eventual tissue, but is that needed? Like that's when I would say, what else can we do to actually get the system to calm down as a whole so that the hip flexor doesn't feel like it's like this all the time. But I don't think we need to be smashing into it at all. <laughs> I think we can do more injury that way. I don't like, and oh, there's so many different ways that we can go here. <laughs> like touch, vibration, pressure, heat, those are all stimulations to the brain. Yes, it's gonna get fluids moving temporarily. It's gonna get, fascia to respond differently within the body, but it's all temporary. And it's a, it's a really a good trick to the nervous system. We're not breaking up scar tissue. We're not breaking up fascia. We're not actually releasing. We're more like relaxing. And so that's why it's not harder is better. It's not dig in more. It's actually how can I relax and get my system to work as a whole better together. And when we can do that, we really start to create like more change, longer lasting change within the body. Okay, I forgot the original question. <laughs> just, just something that people can can see in the morning, something they can oh, begin yes, yeah. to or, do. Or maybe some, yeah, some routines that we can mm -hmm. do either in the morning or throughout our day that are attainable where people who say, I don't have an hour to dedicate to mobility or to flexibility or whatever they think it, it might be or might be required or stretching what are other things that we can do throughout our day in the mornings or while sitting or driving yeah. that increase our mobility and, and our are tangible health for yeah. us? Yes. So this is where it's like, usually when I start people with breath, the easiest thing I can say is do it at least five to 10 minutes before you fall asleep. You're already in bed. You're already comfortable. You can place your hands around your rib cage and then just see where can I, can I expand from my rib cage? Can I slow down my breath? And usually, especially for people who have a hard time sleeping, they're like knocked out. Wow. That's gonna like knock them out right away. <laughs> I can't wait to try this. <laughs> you know, like I have such a hard time. Most, most people do, a lot of people do, especially if there's so much that we're like constantly on the mind, constantly taken care of. So it's hard to always turn off. And when I find that it, rather than thinking of, you know, the perfect type of meditation, because that's not the point of meditation, but how can I tune back into my body and feel my rib cage? And even some people might need to count the breath. Okay, I'll do a four second inhale, and then I'll do an eight second exhale. And it, even that counting then gets you distracted, right, from what's happening outside in the world, and it puts you back into here. And so that alone will start to release and reduce tension. Then I say, okay, now how can we start implementing that throughout the day? So when you are sitting in traffic, place one hand on your rib cage. Can I feel that? Can I calm down my shoulders? Can I lean back into the seat and actually go into my breath? Rather than yelling at the car that just cut me off, how can I go back into a breath pattern? Mm. If I'm washing dishes, how can I remember, oh, close my mouth? Or ask someone, ask your significant other, hey, did you catch me? Just like, hanging out with my mouth open. Like I do it to my fiance all the time. I'm always like closing his mouth. We, we, we poke, we poke. <laughs> you're so sweet to like close the mouth. In our if your mouth is open or you yawn, we poke the mouth. <laughs> so it sounds like you live in a much healthier household. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. great. So I, I like say, how can I bring that in? How can I, if there's a deadline coming up, rather than getting stressed out about it, how can I go back into my breath? So that it becomes a one to two minute type thing, rather than when am I taking those 10 minutes out of the day? When am I doing, it becomes a real life experience. Like you're actually putting this into the stressors that you're having in your everyday life. If I could put this into my everyday, like it starts to become a regular practice. It has to be conscious before it becomes unconscious. And mm -hmm. we have to practice that and program it in. And the more that you do it, the better it becomes. So it, it's not like an hour once a week, it is a one to, one to two minute thing every single time I catch myself in stress, every single time I'm catching myself opening my mouth more than closing it, you know? And it just becomes this conscious thing. Cold showers are great if it's hard for people to understand 
how to shift their that system. It is like I hate cold water, hate it. I don't take cold baths for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> but I've done the cold exposure where you're going into really like very cold temperature water. And what I love is that at first it is that shock. It is that inhalation state of like your body freaking out. And then you're able to slow down, actually use longer exhales. And eventually I'm nasal breathing and chilling and I can stay in there for a while without feeling anything. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's, a, yes, there's going to be good things physiologically happening, but the mental shift that that can create, and it gives you power back over that anxiety. It gives you power back over the stress and it gives you power ultimately back over your body. And I think it's, I've had a uh, pelvic floor therapist tell me that it's something they want all of their mamas to do before they have a baby and mm -hmm. to give them power back over pain. It's something that I've seen work with people who have really high anxiety, gives you power back into your body. It might not be the fix. It might not, you know, but it can help to start shift that. And if we can just experience that, I think that's when it becomes really good to like, if you need that, do at least 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute at the end of your shower and see if you can calm the breath and calm mm -hmm. the body and get into nasal breathing as you're in that cold shower. I, I love what you're saying. And I, I have to ask, because I know that for nasal breathers, um, that may feel really good if your passageways are actually clear and, and someone commented about it as well. I happen to have one-sided deviated septum on the inside that I never got fixed. I don't care to anytime soon. So there are times where I do have to open my mouth, even when I'm eating, just to get the full breath, because I do feel somewhat of a restricted airway. Is that something that like, I mean, I'm just stuck with what it, what it is, right? Or like, should I, we get that? Or should I get it? <laughs> you, can actually, you can actually train your airway to be able to tolerate nasal breathing more. And one of my favorite examples is Brian. So Brian McKenzie is like my mentor of all things breath. Like he's oh, cool. literally the person out there actually doing the studies with Stanford, actually doing the work and is super smart. Um, I was just having a conversation with him yesterday. Um, but he shows all the time, I, he has a really bad deviated septum. So he'll just like stick his nose in the camera and just be like, <laughs> I have, I can't, I can't say anything because my nose goes like this wow. and yet he's a, he's a nose breather. So mm -hmm. we can train our bodies to, yes, we can train our bodies to be able to do these things. We just have to give it the opportunity to start practicing it. So I'm, I, it's funny because I will, I'm a nose, I'm a nose breather, but I breathe fine to the nose, but I'm actually a, a clencher. So I actually don't have my mouth open, but I actually need to like remind myself like, Hey, open your mouth, like let your, let your jaw relax. Um, <laughs> So that doesn't have as much to do. I, I don't know where that plays in the breathing, but um, it's interesting because I'm like, oh, uh, that's the thing that people do, but it's not my natural state is here. It's like, it's like holding my tension in my, yeah. in my jaw and my neck and my face. And that's why well, I, that's I would say, where off. is the tongue resting at like mm -hmm. a normal place? Because even like we can go into, there's functional dentistry, which is actually a thing, not my wow. expertise, but that's a thing as well. And if the tongue is always pushing forward or there's a lot of tension within the jaw, we're automatically more into that sympathetic state as well. So we actually want the tongue naturally a little bit further back and up toward the roof of your mouth so that when you close your mouth, your teeth aren't together. Mm. Wow. So the tongue is up toward the roof of the mouth and back more. And when you swallow, it gives this roll of the tongue, which is actually a very soothing thing for the nervous system. And it puts you it helps to turn on that parasympathetic system. But if our tongue is always pushing forward or our teeth are always clenched and we're more in the sympathetic, which is why you could be having neck pain more often. Yeah, I will literally, I'm like, it's hard for me to actually put my tongue there. Like mm -hmm. it sits in the bottom and the front, I realized. Like, I like, it's like shaking as I try to put it in the, in the top towards the back. That's, you know that's what, crazy. When I was a kid, they it's actually, all, they, yeah, it's all connected. They actually noticed that my, I had a tongue thrust. And so they actually had me, carry a bag of, I was like in high school, carry a Ziploc bag of Cheerios. And every time one would dissolve, I'd put it at the roof of my mouth and have to hold it there with my tongue. Oh, wow. And until it would dissolve. And then I would like to have normal conversation and then grab the next Cheerio all like, day. 
That's awesome. That's a great exercise. Yeah. And I never knew, I like, I was a little bit resentful to like do this weird thing, but now I can see what they were trying to do. They never explained that to me, Jen. Do you see? The they education. Me, we need yeah. people. They just gave me Cheerios and they're like, dissolve it. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. But you did it. That's amazing. Most, I probably would have been like, this isn't working. Why do I need to do it? Well, well I've like, been like this, just eating Cheerios. Like, well, okay, it was vain you. because yeah. they said your teeth are going to go like this eventually okay. so there was vanity in it yeah. um but That's speaking of vanity it. here i want to i actually want to ask something that i do know a lot of hold women on. hold on hold on yeah i still want a movement i still want <laughs> she said the rich no she gave us the breath but okay i want a couple examples of what they're going to see when they go to your page and they and they go to your instagram or your website what kind of routine movements can we do for our bodies mm -hmm. that are essential for health yeah. Okay, then I'll come back to money. <laughs> okay. Back, back to vanity later. I'll come back to vanity. <laughs> so one of the first ones I would say, sit on the ground more. You guys are doing that. Super awesome. That's something that everyone needs to be able to get back into more and more. And that could start with stacking up pillows underneath your bum if you need to. Like, you don't have to start on the ground. If it's super uncomfortable, figure out a way that you can start a little bit higher and then work your way down. But spend at least five minutes sitting hopefully 10 minutes like watch a show and sit on the ground yeah exactly yeah, we live on the ground we live <laughs> yeah, on the ground exactly right here. so you guys are like golden on while you're ground. there wrestle with somebody yeah yes. <laughs> okay yeah uh, next thing i would say sitting is a lot more it's going to put a flexion bias into the low back so in order to get out of that spend some time on your belly like it is if we it's like babies the thing if we just think of i've been doing this a lot how can I do something that's different? <laughs> How could I change that up? How can I do something that is literally the opposite of that? And no, that's really it, on, laying sorry. on the belly. On that note, so again, I don't want to go, I, we can be, talk to you all day, but when we're talking about doing something different, sometimes that causes pain, right? And we talked about how pain is, is a beautiful messenger, messenger, but the question is when we're doing that, like, for example, I've been changing my position like 15 times yeah, we're all because when I, I actually have a very hard time sitting cross-legged, I get, I get numbness in my feet. I have a very, like, it's very uncomfortable for me. And I, so the question is when I feel discomfort, do I go, I should sit here more or do I go, uh, I should probably shift into a more comfortable position. No, that has to do with so water. Num of, numbness in feet is not enough water. That I, I agree with is you. That, it could no. oh, absolutely just, no. don't make things up like but it sounded good though oh, he just, Jen, he just, I drink them because i don't drink enough water but it could be all of these things all of the above but i guess my question is like yeah. when it comes to pain you know do we lean into pain or do we how, what's that fine line of respecting pain but also recognizing like oh this is an area i'm neglecting do i need to sit here more or do it or less what does that look like so i would say you want to sit there at least until you feel it so as soon as you like you do you shouldn't need to hang out when your your legs are in or numb right if you're sure. feeling numb get out of that position totally and i have the same problem actually i have super tight glutes so my hips are really tight so external rotation for me is not great so sitting in in crisscross applesauce i get my feet as well start to fall asleep and i have to change position mm -hmm. and so if that's happening yes you <laughs> I just need to drink more water, which is yeah. <laughs> but going into the position, how can I go into it every day? So going into it every on a daily basis, and then how can I get more specific with it then? Mm -hmm. So that's when I would say, I know for me, it's external rotation. So I need to do a stretch that's specific for external rotation. If I actually want to see a change in my cross-legged position. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so yes, you want to you want to respect it by saying, oh, I'm noticing that this is happening. Now, what can I do to add in? So maybe before I go and I work out, I'm going to do a, a two minute mobility flow for my hips that I know in specific ways that I'm restricted, or I'm going to spend two minutes after I work out and I'm going to do that hold, right? Okay. So that it's not now, and I and I cannot do the like add in an hour of mobility a day. I'm like. I'm not going to do that. I don't expect mm -hmm. you to do that. So if I know my upper back is super restricted, can I do that before? I, can I do that one mobility exercise before I get out of bed? Can I do one active one while I'm at my chair working at my desk? Can I, can I do 
a couple of mobility things before I work out that I know I'm restricted in? Can I do a couple after I work out? Can I do one before I go to bed? And all of a sudden you sprinkle it in. And as long as you can maintain that, or maybe it's only one to two that you know you can maintain, the more consistent sprinkling it in and only doing like two to three minutes every day, the better can the better your results you're going to see in your body, like 100%. If you're only doing it one hour a day or one hour a week, mm. it's, it's better. Off. And rather than ch choosing one hour a week to focus on this, you're saying it's better to choose moments throughout the day, but doing it every day. Okay, sorry, I really hijacked Hedon's question. So going back to you, you wanted to see, we, we want like some sort of um, movement, right? That we can- Correct, we I want to move. He don't wants to move right now. So give him a movement to do. Let's test his mobility. Let's see. Go. Yeah, give him a movement. <laughs> no, then you, don't have to, you don't have to make it a test, but something sure. that is beneficial to everybody. Because there's guarantee right. that you have 25 movements right now that no matter who you are, you can benefit from. 100%. <laughs> so one of the things that you guys can still see me. Yep. Okay. yep. It's a little dark. Sorry. So one of the things that I like to actually test people is going into a 90-90 position. So 90 degrees in the front leg, 90 degrees between the legs, and 90 degrees in the back leg. So literally like 90-90-90, right? Across the board. Now, Eve, can your knee is automatically popping off the floor, right? Mm -hmm. Mine too. You, have a you probably have limited hip external rotation. I do. And it was so always a problem in gymnastics. Sauce, your feet fall asleep. We solved it, right? Every now day. we just need to know what is the thing to actually get that better. And that's where if you actually just then, rather than leaning into it and falling, folding over, which most people do, how can I get more specific into my hip? And that's where I say, so if I just start to rotate toward that leg just a little bit and then think of sticking that tailbone out, so driving that wow. hip bone forward mm. and then feeling like you're going to push your knee back into your hip joint. So I'm going to lean and push that knee back. Mm -hmm. And do you feel a stretch in your glute? I do. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Here. And now you don't even need to lean very far forward. Yeah. And you already feel it. Now here, I would recommend you hold it for at least a minute or two, and then you work on active portions where you're pressing your foot into the floor, and then you're trying to lift that foot off the floor. Try to foot into the floor. <laughs> but yeah, pressing I can do. The lifting, that's very interesting. It's very hard, but when we work on both the passive and the active, we're actually going to start to create change. And if we did that, two to three minutes every single day, you're gonna awesome. start to notice a change within your body. Or same oh, as I rotate, is my butt almost toward the ground? Like, mm. it doesn't need to be flush, but, or is it like way back here? Mm, like some people have to do this, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So if not, if it feels comfortable, your hip internal rotation is probably normal. And then we can go to the other side. So it's a quick and easy mm -hmm. way that we can really test and assess with the body. That makes Is sense. that one of those? Uh, that, that was great. That so was, once again, I'm glad you asked. I really legs. am. So once again, it's 90, 90 to confirm. And you want, just for the people who are watching, you want to coat exactly 90, 90. And yeah. I want my knee towards the ground. I want my knee yeah. on the ground. That's the goal. So you want, so I try to lower the light. So you want literally 90 degrees. So you don't want it here. You don't want it here. Yes. Right? We want 90 degrees in the front leg, 90 degrees between, and then 90 degrees in the back. And are your hips both on the floor? What? Are both of your hip bones on the floor? No. Okay. So if I, it depends on where I rotate. So if I right. rotate toward my front, I'm gonna get more of the glute stretch. But for some people, they sit here and their knee plops down. The ketones. Which yeah. is good That's external ro rotation. So he's great in external rotation. He doesn't really need His triangles are, yeah, it's very good. Exactly. So <laughs> if you're getting knee tension, how can I work on my hip more so that I get into more of that external rotation? And this is actually a great stretch for people who train jujitsu because yes. we need a lot of this. And this has always been my, I've always said like, oh, I'm not good at triangles because I can't do this thing. Yeah. And I was going to say, I think that's actually why I get my knee injured in that position because my external rotation is tight. So I'm forcing it in my knee, right? 
100%. Good job. You just self-assess yourself. You self-assess. So that's our goal mm -hmm. is to self-assess. And so what you, so you mentioned that with the mobility method, right, there's going to be tons of these self-assessment tools, right, yes. that we can, in, in this questionnaire. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where we can find it and how yeah, we can Yeah, but before all... we end it, oh, before okay, we yeah, end, one more. I know, I feel you wrapping. <laughs> Jen, I got one more thing. We can and come here's... back and we can just do movements next time. Okay, okay. True, true, true. So I, I want to ask this because I think that this is a, um, it's a systemic ideology that I, I subscribe to very early on in life. And it was this idea that every woman should have this flat, sucked in stomach. And so every female I went to school with at every age level sucks their belly in when specifically when we're around men, but even around other women. And so that breath holding up thing was something every woman did. And, and I, especially I, as a dancer. Too, and as right? a dancer. But, yeah, yeah. Like in the industry, like I was also wearing very revealing clothing. I came through the generation of very low, the Britney Spears's low jeans, crop top. So everything was, every, every girl I knew was sucking in all the time. And I do see it. I see it at beaches. I know we're all doing it in our swimsuits. Can you give some insight and maybe some permission or ideas of what that does to our body, whether we should be doing that, whether that's okay. Give me some insight real quick. Yeah. I, I really hope that our society starts to move away from needing to do that as much. I know it's hard with social media because things get manipulated and distorted a different way because we can edit things, right? But so our, our expectations are unrealistic. Yeah. So unrealistic. And we're striving for something and, and needing to feel like we need a hold or even shoulders down and back. Or like, I don't like that cue because then that looks what that does to my rib cage. And if we're talking about alignment in the body, the one thing that I like to talk about most is your airways. So when my air comes in, my neck, I want that to be directly over my rib cage that expands for my diaphragm. And then what holds at the bottom is my pelvic floor. And that should be able to naturally lift and take that pressure. But now if my shoulders are down and back and my mm -hmm. belly is tucked in, I have more pressure going down this way. I have more pressure going up this way into my neck. <laughs> And I have a lot of tension happening in just different areas and especially down. So if I hold my belly in, it doesn't give my, this whole pressure system, the opportunity to do its job. Its job is that it expands in a 360 pattern and we should have this natural ability to expand and to contract. Mm. And if we don't allow the bellies to relax and have that opportunity, to actually do that we put a lot of downward pressure um and then that's when you have a baby and it's normal to leak it's normal to not do jumping anymore oh i can't do this i can't do that or even you go to crossfit say you didn't even do you know you haven't had a baby or you haven't done anything but you're getting separation in the abdominal wall or you're getting leakage happening down and no one I wants to talk about it. Started, I'm embarrassed yeah. about it. I like, I must be the only one. I'm getting hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids even. Those are, that's pressure going down. Mm. The whole point is that we want to balance out our pressure system. If we can balance out our pressure system, we naturally start to align the body better. And, and that doesn't have to mean a perfect symmetrical spine because I have scoliosis. I don't have a perfect symmetrical spine and I'm not in pain. So and even though my scoliosis might not be as bad as someone else, and who knows, that could be driving their pain, but ideally we want to start to see how can I stack my neck over my rib cage and bring awareness to this and then stack it over this. Because if, I, if I'm here all the time, my rib cage is out, my, hip, tail, my hips are gonna be forward. And then I'm saying I have tight hip flexors all the time. I just need to stretch these out but if this is what I'm gonna stand up and, and go back into, it doesn't matter. Mm. So we have to, again, working that rib cage, so key, working the chest and opening up the chest. Like I like to do a lot of chest stretches, especially because we're forward onto our phones a lot. Mm -hmm. I like to do a lot of stuff. Um, and then last thing, so I use tune-up fitness balls and they're a little bit squishier. Um, so they give a little bit more rather than like a lacrosse ball. 
And for men and women, I do the stretch for both genders. <laughs> and you just stick it, you fill your sit bone and you stick it on the inside of your sit bone. So it's not going anywhere crazy, it's muscle. <laughs> and you literally breathe and sit. And there'll be different pressures, whether it's forward or whether it's back, that you feel different tensions. And can I place my hands in my rib cage, start to relax my belly, relax this pressure, so then I can get a natural rebound from my pelvic floor, my core, my rib cage, and then stack that all the way to my neck. Release neck tension, back pain, issues at the pelvic floor. Okay. Amazing. Mm. And Jen, just, just because I don't, I don't want people to going out and Amazoning too many things if they don't have to, or if they can do something right now, can they just use a tennis ball? Yeah. So they can just sit on it a tennis ball? It might be a little bit bigger. Oh, so it's pretty hard. Um, and lacrosse ball is fine. It's really hard. Um, I don't I know just, any California person that has a lacrosse ball. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah, East Coast, maybe. Sure. Maybe. <laughs> you can use an orange. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all that thing, you don't even have to sit on anything. If you just start with these breathing exercises and saying, where's my rib cage? It's going to naturally start it. to align that pelvis. It's going to help the breath. It's going to bring everything kind of full circle and back together. Perfect. Amazing. This is such incredible information. Yeah. And I think it's just so important for people to remember how this is all integrated because again, I think I included, it's so easy for us to just go fix me. Okay, I can go back to my life now. Yeah. Just, you know, not breathing, not taking care of myself, not stretching, not. And then you go, why do I get? Why do I always get injured? Oh, oh my gosh! So having this just different approach, I hope some people's eyes were open to this. And um, as we were mentioning, can you tell us a little bit about the um, the mobility method and what that looks like? And if somebody says, okay, I, I haven't found a physical therapist yet, but I want to do this assessment myself. I want to assess my body. I want to see what needs where I'm not meeting my body's needs and how to approach that what can they do yeah i mean exactly like you said that i love how you intro it because it's not going to be the thing i don't know if it's going to fix anyone that's not the intention right the intention is to increase someone's awareness of their own body so the mobility method i mean i'm sure if you just google the mobility method it would be the first thing that popped up but it's all in my instagram as well at doc gen fit like click the link all of them are there um, so the mobility method, it's like, there's over 70 exercises. And here's the thing, the exercises don't have to be super complicated. And I think when usually people think of this mobility routine, what's sexy on Instagram is seeing these crazy flows and these like putting your body in different positions. What's actually sexy is breaking it back down to the basics and doing the things that your body's neglecting. That's it. Like if you're coming sitting on, a, like, sitting on a ball and breathing is what you're telling. <laughs> <laughs> like I have patients who have 10 years of back pain come to me and we get them to breathe and change and they're crying and their world has changed. Wow. And that's why it's like, it doesn't have to be this, don't go in with expectations. That's what I would say. If you're going into the mobility method, know that it's your toolbox to continue to refer back to. To, to explore to your body, assess, to continue to get to know your body, mm -hmm. continue to move through slowly. There's breath classes in there. Um, there's generalized pain flows as well. So say you have a knee thing going on. I'll give you a generalized mobility program, but I always start with, did you self-assess? Like, don't just mm -hmm. use this and think that it's everything. Go back and self-assess. And so there's different tools. Um, and it just, my, my hope and my for it is that it's your lifetime program to always be able to refer back to. It's your toolbox of mobility to see where am I neglecting? What can I be doing more? What am I needing to add in? And it goes all the way from the neck all the way to the toes. Mm. So don't Great forget little, the toes. Jen. Don't forget the toes. <laughs> yeah, Jen, you know, this is valuable information. And I've said this in the beginning, like you're the, the top female I've seen on Instagram, not only giving away such valuable free content, but you also have comprehensive programs. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. And if you, and, and you said it, I have it on video that you can come back and teach us more movement. <laughs> so, um, I really hope that we can do that again with you soon. We are so grateful, not only for your time, but for, I know the deep and lengthy and hard work that it took for you to not only acquire that knowledge, but to make it into programs that are digestible, fun, Accessible. beautiful, and sexy. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Hiron, yes. for being here and asking thank such you. an important question. Yeah.
That was a great question. So, and, <laughs> and one, not, and just as a final on the goodbye is, I think about how this mobility has so much um, similarity with jujitsu mm -hmm. because the way that we teach jujitsu is this ability to be able to fight for an hour or an hour and a half or two hours and being able to really go the long run and being able to be around the martial arts for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. So mobility is something that you talked about it. We said in the beginning, we talked a little bit about how it's a, it's a lifetime thing. It's a forever thing. And there are people right now watching this that could be, you know, 29 years old, 37 years old, 42. And there, there's an energy of back to what you said, which is, I don't really quite need it right now, mm -hmm. but we're building the habit because there's two ways to grow old. You can grow old moving, or you can grow old, broken and stiff and unable to enjoy the things that life has to offer like jujitsu. So. Thank you for giving the information that allows us to do the things that we enjoy for so much longer. Yay. I love it. Thank okay. you guys. Thank you so much, Jen. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll be um, posting all of Jen's information, all the links, her um, handles and the links to mobility method and optimal body as well. Yes. Uh, anything else that you want to say about where people can find you? I mean, Instagram is going to be the number one place that you're going to see my content. You're going to, um, and there's, there's a lot on there. And <laughs> um, I guess there is Doc Gen Fit, all separated, the Optimal Body app. You can find all my whole Instagram separated by body part or diagnosis. So back on the app, on the app, you can separate it by body part. Great. Oh my gosh. Amazing. You guys get into it. Thank you all for coming here this week. We really appreciate your time. And we are so happy that we can gather weekly on Women Empowered Alive. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye.